Hello and welcome to Chapter 34, Head and Spine Trauma Lecture. In this chapter, you will learn about injury to the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, both of which are encased in and protected by bone. The brain, located in the cranial cavity, is the largest component of the central nervous system. It contains billions of neurons that serve a variety of vital functions. An understanding of form and function of the spinal anatomy and a high index of suspicion for spinal trauma injury is essential to good patient care with this type of traumatic injury. Okay, so let's get started. The central nervous system, like I mentioned on the last slide, consists of the brain and spinal cord. There are two primary divisions of insult that could occur, and there's head trauma and then there's uh, spinal cord injuries. Okay, so let's talk about the head trauma. It's a general term that just includes both head injuries and traumatic brain injuries. So a head injury is a traumatic insult to the head that may result in injury to the soft tissues of the scalp or bony structures of the head and skull, not including the face. And a traumatic brain injury is an impairment of the brain function caused by an external force that may involve physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and vocational changes. So spinal cord injury, that's an injury of the spinal cord such as ischemia or bruising, fracture, or severing that disrupts normal spinal cord functions. The head and spine are often injured in association with each other. Okay, so let's do some anatomy and physiology review. First thing we're going to talk about is the scalp. And the scalp is composed of multiple layers. You have subcutaneous tissue that contains major vessels that bleed when lacerated. And then you have superficial fascia, and that is attached to the vessels. Do not underestimate the blood loss potential from scalp hemorrhaging. And do not get distracted, though, from other life-threatening injuries. Okay, next is the skull. It consists of 28 bones that make up the cranium, auditory ossicles, and the face. The cranial vault, it's a eight flat irregular bones. It generates blood cells. It protects the brain by direct in impacts around it, and it provides a container for the brain, cerebral spinal fluid, and blood. And a hematoma would increase intracranial pressure, and that's known as ICP. This figure shows the bones of the skull. Okay, so the floor of the cranial vault consists of several ridges and depressions that have openings that allow nerves to exit the skull. When it comes to coup contra coup injury, the brain impacts two sides of the skull. Lacerations from skull floor can occur and contusions from contact with frontal and occipital bones. Okay, so the base of the skull, it consists of parts of the ethmoid, cephnoid, occipital, frontal, and temporal bones. And um, it's when it comes to a basilar skull fracture, it uh, can involve the temporal bone, and it's re revealed in the field by drainage of central or cerebral spinal fluid from the nose or the ears. And the most common location of drainage is the nose, and that indicates a fracture of the ethmoid or the temporal bone. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the brain. It contains billions of neurons that serve various vital functions. The major regions are the cerebrum, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. It accounts for 2% of body weight, and it's the most metabolically active and perfusion-sensitive organ in the body. It's completely reliant on a consistent and constant source of oxygen and glucose via cerebral blood flow. Loss of blood flow for five to 10 seconds will result in unconsciousness. So first let's talk about the cer cerebrum. It's the largest portion of the brain. It's responsible for higher functions such as reasoning. It's divided into the right and left hemispheres. The cerebral cortex is the largest portion of the cerebrum. It regulates voluntary skeletal movement and level of awareness. Injury may result in paresthesia, weakness, and paralysis of the extremities. Each hemisphere is divided into specialized areas called lobes. The frontal lobe is important to voluntary motor action and personality traits. 
Injury could result in seizures or a placid reactions, so that's a flat effect. It filters the raw emotional impulses from the limbic system. An injury to the frontal lobe may result in a personality change in the patient. The parental lobe processes information from sensory receptors in the skin and joints. It governs uh, the perception of pain, temperature, and vibration. It is also responsible for the ability to perceive position and movement of one's body or limbs. Injury to this lobe may prevent patients from calculating two plus two or knowing how many dimes are in a dollar. The occipital lobe processes visual information. A blow to the back of the head causes uh, one to see stars. And the temporal lobe controls speech, long-term memory, hearing, taste, and smell. Then there's the cerebellum. So it's located beneath the cerebral hemispheres in the inferior posterior part of the brain, sometimes called the athlete's brain. It's responsible for maintenance of posture, equilibrium, and coordination, and injuries can prevent the patient from performing rapid alternating, um, alternating movements. And then there's the brainstem. It consists of the midbrain, pons, and medulla. It's located in or at the base of the brain. It connects the spinal cord to the rest of the brain, and it houses many structures crucial to vital functions. The meninges. So the meninges are a protective layer that surround and enfold the entire central nervous system. The dura mater is a strong fibrous outer layer. It covers the brain and it's formally attached to the internal wall of the skull. It splits into two surfaces and forms the venous sinuses. Any injury to these sinuses can cause a subdural hematoma. You have the arachnoid, it's a delicate, transparent second layer. And then the pia matter, that's the thin, translucent, and highly vascular third layer. Uh, the pia matter adheres directly to the surface of the brain. Between each of these layers is the potential space in which bleeding can occur. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of bleeding. An epidural hematoma occurs between the dura mater and the skull and is usually caused by rupture of a middle men meningeal artery. Okay. A subdural hematoma, it occurs between the dura mater and the arachnoid membrane and is all usually caused by a rupture of the bridging veins in this space. Then you have the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and that occurs below the arachnoid membrane. The spine, so it consists of 33 bones or vertebrae divided in the five sections. It's stabilized by ligaments and muscles and supports and protects natural elements. So it will, it allows for fluid movement and an erect stature. The vertebrae bottom body bone and supports and stabilizes the body. Basic characteristics shared by the vertebrae. So um, expect the atlas and axis in C1 and C2. And then separation and cushioning of each vertebra by intervertebral disc. As the body ages, these discs become thinner and um, that causes height loss associated with aging. So stress on the vertebral column can cause discs to herniate into the spinal canal. This may result in injury to the spinal cord or nerve rot. So the vertebral column can sustain normal flexation and extension of 60 to 70% without stressing the spinal cord. Now let's talk about the spinal cord. So the, it transmits nerve impulses to the brain and the body. It's located at the base of the brain. It leaves the skull through the form magnum. It separates um, at the base of the skull. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that emerge from different segments of the spinal cord. C1 through to C7 exit the spinal cord above their respective vertebrae. C8 exits below the C7 vertebra. All the other spinal nerves exit the spinal column below, below the respective vertebra for which they are named. 
Okay, so the spinal nerve groups are named based on the source of origin and point of termination. Okay, so converge into plexus that enables several spinal cord nerves to control one area of the body. So one example is the cervical plexus, so C1 through C5. And then the phrenic nerve, so C3 through C5, also arises from plexus and contains nerves that supply the diaphragm. You have the brachial plexus, that's C5 through T1. It joins nerves controlling the upper extremities. The lumbar plexus, that's L1 through L4, supplies the skin and muscles of the abdominal wall, external genitalia, and part of the lower limbs. And then you have the sacral plexus, that's L4 through S4. It gives rise to the sciatic nerves, supplies the buttocks, uh, perineum, and most of the lower limbs. Okay, and so when you talk about the nervous system, you need to talk about the sympathetic nervous system. And this system mobilizes the body for activity. The brain transmits information through the brainstem and the spinal cord. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system controls sweating, pupil dilation, temperature regulation, and the fight or flight responses. Loss of the sympathetic uh, stimulation can disrupt homeostasis which leaves the body poorly equipped to deal with changes in the environment. And then there's the parasympathetic nervous system. This includes fibers arising from the cranial and sacral nerves, and it carries signals to the organs of the abdomen, heart, lungs, and skin. It slows heart rate in an attempt to control increasing blood pressure when the sympathetic nerves are stimulated. Okay, so let's go into the patient assessment recognition of the presence of a brain injury and beginning immediate care. So scene size up. You want to assess scene safety and consider the need for additional resources. The following events should prompt a search for signs and symptoms of head and traumatic brain injury. So a motor vehicle accident or a direct blow or a fall from heights, assault or sports injuries and or high velocity crashes. So we're talking greater than 40 miles an hour with severe vehicle damage. This is, um, these indicate the need for full spinal immobilization, okay? An unrestrained occupant of a moderate to high speed MBA, vehicular damage in the compartmental intrusion of 12 inches into the patient's seating space, a fall of an adult from a height greater than 20 feet or a fall of a child from a height of 10 feet or greater and penetrating trauma near the spine. Those definitely need to have um, full spinal mobile motion restriction applied. Also ejection from an MVA, motorcycle crash of greater than 20 miles an hour, adult pedestrian or auto bicycle crash of greater than 20 miles an hour, death of an occupant in the same passenger compartment or a rollover crash, which is restrained. So ensure manual stabilization of the cervical spine in a neutral inline position. You need to determine the level of consciousness and conduct your primary survey. Apply a cervical collar if your findings require it, but first assess the ABCs and the pulse, motor, and sensory functions. Prior to measuring the patient for cervical collar, the cervical and sp um, thoracic spine must be in the neutral position. So do not let the patient slouch when you're measuring that. So ensure the open airway and be prepared to roll patients onto their side to prevent aspiration. If local protocols allow a nasal airway, use caution and because um, of the possibility of you know, the skull fracture. A nasal fracture, though, too, as well, you should not use it. An advanced airway management in patients with a head or spine injury. So maintain manual stabilization during all airway management procedures. A nasotracheal innervation carries the risk and is generally contraindicated when you have any type of head injury. So whenever possible, use another method. And if the patient will tolerate an advanced airway, um, or will not tolerate due to combativeness or clenched teeth, you need to consider pharmacologically assisted innovation, so rapid sequence innovation. Okay, so when it comes to ventilation in context of a head or spine injury, 
you need to ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation in any patient with a head injury. Do not defer oxygenation until you're en route if there are signs of hypoxia. Um, administer 100% oxygen via non-rebreather if the patient's breathing adequately and administer a bag valve mask and 100% oxygen for patients with inadequate ventilation. So oxygen should flow at a rate of 12 to 15 liters a minute and optimally you should ventilate the patient to maintain the end tidal between 35 and 40. Okay, so um, if you cannot monitor end tidal, then a respiratory rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute in an adult patient will achieve the target rate. You need to avoid the uh, routine hyperventilation. The Brain Trauma Physician uh, Foundation, so that's the BTF, recommends hyperventilation only if signs of cerebral herniation are present. So the recommended rates of hyperventilation are an adult is 20 breaths per minute, child is 25, and an infant, which is of course younger than one year old, it's uh, 30 breaths per minute. Next is circulation. So in the absence of a pulse, of course, immediately initiate CPR. Control major bleeding with direct pressure, gauze, hemostatic agents, or pressure dressings, and do not apply excessive pressure, though, to the scalp lacerations in which an underlying fracture is suspected. Examine skin color, temperature, and moisture, so patients with significant sensory loss may take a, uh, on the surrounding environmental temperature. So patients with neurogenic shock will have skin that is warm, dry, and flushed because of the vasodilation or the dilated blood vessels and the absence of sweating. Volume resuscitation might be necessary if there is an absence or diminished pulse. So estimate at least um, or establish at least uh, an 18 gauge with normal saline or lactated ringers and do not administer dextrose containing solutions because they may worsen cerebral edema. Restrict your use of IV fluids for patients with a severe closed head injury. If uh, patients in pure neurogenic shock may need some type of uh, uh, vasopressors. So use a cardiac monitor with every critically injured patient and consider transcutaneous patient pacing for refractory symptomatic bradycardia. Reevaluate the patient's mental status in response to stimuli and note any changes since your initial contact with the patient. Check for presence of a pulse. Evaluate monitor sensory function in each extremity and directly observe the back to assess for penetrating trauma. Palpate the patient's spinal cord for deformity, step offs, point tenderness, and crepitus and use the information to determine whether the patient needs spinal immobilization. So with head trauma and uh, traumatic brain injuries, the pupils can reveal valuable information about the patient and his or her condition. So consider performing a quick baseline assessment through the disability portion of your primary survey. Remove any clothing that would obstruct your, your secondary assessment. So cover the patient with a blanket though as needed to maintain that normal body um, temperature. And then the level of consciousness. So when you suspect a head injury, you need to perform a baseline neurological assessment using APPU and record the time and then obtain a Glasgow coma score. A change in the level of consciousness is the single most important sign that you can detect when you assess the severity of a brain injury. Level of consciousness usually indicates extent of brain dysfunction. So formulating a plan. Prompt transport to the trauma center is crucial to the survival of the patient. Consider air transport if transport time will be long, and if transporting by ground, do so quickly and cautiously. Many patients will require a neurosurgical intervention and transfer the patient directly to the trauma center with neurosurgical services. This could be the difference between life and death for the patient. So placement on the backboard, spinal immobilization of the patient may involve a backboard, a scoop stretcher, or a similar device. The timing of this action is based on the condition of your patient. So 
for critical patients, apply the immobilization after the primary survey to enable rapid transport. For a non-critical patient, apply the immobilization after the secondary assessment. And most patients can be log rolled while you watch for deformity or injury and palpate over each posterior spinous process for pain, deformity, or step offs. A reliable patient meets the following um, conditions. Is he alert and oriented? Has no language barrier? Has no evidence of brain injury or intoxication? Or has no alteration in his or her ability to make the decisions or recognize pain and injury? In reliable patients, the following may eliminate the need for spinal mobilization. The absence of pain or tenderness along the spine, a normal neurological exam, and the absence of distracting injuries. Always protect paralyzed limbs with appropriate restraint and stretcher mobilization. So patients in severe pain may require an alternative method to transfer transfer them to the long backboard. You could use a scoop stretcher to lift the patient. Other crew member can slide the backboard or air mattress or vacuum mattress under the patient. You could also choose to use the scoop stretcher alone without transferring the patient to the backboard or other device. The time on the backboard should be limited because skin breakdown can be a complication of um, full spinal immobilization. So conditions caused by excessive pressure over the primary supports for the patient's weight. So they're on the bones of the buttocks or the scapular ridges or the base of the occiput. There are several devices and they've been developed to improve patient comfort. These are the vacuum mattresses or back rafts and concave backboards. Okay, so this uh, photo shows the placement of a patient on a backboard. And the back raft. So this takes pressure off specific areas of the back and uh, it, you fill voids that might otherwise allow patient movement. So towel rolls and blankets to void pad voids between the patient and the backboard. And, uh, and then there's concave backboards so they conform more closely to the patient's anatomy than do flat backboards. All right, so history taking. Patient's reliability should be assessed. So patients should be considered unreliable if they present with an acute stress reaction, distracting injuries, or alteration in their mental status due to brain injury or intoxication. Maintain a high level or index of suspicion. Treat all patients who experience major trauma above the clavicle or who are found unresponsive as if they have a spinal injury. Obtain a sample history. You want to use the signs and symptoms of the current complaint, circumstances of the incident, and forces to which the patient was subjected. So blunt or penetrating trauma, flexation injury, torsion of the neck. In the case of the fall, you want to know the height of the fall, or was anything struck on the way down? How did the patient land, and what did the patient land on? In a case of the vehicular crash, you want to use the position of the restraints positions, position in the vehicle, and the degree of damage on the vehicle. Also, the time of the initial injury and any change in the patient's presentation. When it comes to the secondary assessment, you want to modify the physical exam of any patient with a suspected spinal cord injury. So you want to know the level of consciousness, the reliability as a historian, and the mechanism of injury. In case of high or intermediate risk mechanisms, when the patient has not already been immobilized, complete the physical exam with the patient in the neutral position without moving the spine. Apply manual stabilization. You could ask the patient not to move unless asked. Or administer sedation or RSI procedures depending on the patient's ability to protect their airway. And it's mostly for a combative patient. Thoroughly assess the head and face for soft tissue injuries or bone instability depression or drainage from the nose or ears. Also, you're looking for um, ecchymosis or battle signs and or paraorbital ecchymosis, and that's bruising under the eyes, and that's raccoon eyes. Okay, so reevaluate these areas. If the cervical collar is not in place, and frequently monitor the pupil size, shape, uh, quality, and reactivity. Also assess both the direct and um, pupil response to light. 
So a sluggish pupil is an early sign of increased intracranial pressure. It also um, could indicate cerebral hypoxia. If the patient is conscious, uh, evaluate extraocular movements and evaluate the chest and abdomen for both internal and external injuries as well. Monitor the cardiovascular system for signs of shock. In male patients, assess for priapism and look for abnormal posturing. Obtain a glucose level in patients who show evidence of alterations in sensations. So assess increased uh, intracranial pressure. So ICP cannot be quantified in the pre-hospital setting, but severity of increases can be estimated. Uh, crucial treatment decisions are based on the presence or absence of key findings such as posturing, hypotension or hypertension, or abnormal pupil signs. Use serial glass calcoma scores and pupillary assessments to monitor the progression of ICP. And the neurologic exam. So it's intended to establish a baseline for later comparison and to determine whether to immobilize the patient. All right, so determine the level of consciousness and note the AFPU in the primary, and then address the glass calcoma score level during further assessments. Okay, so myotomes are regions in the body where the motor components of the spinal nerves supply specific tissues and muscles. You need to bilaterally assess each major motor group from top down. So when you ask the patient to flex, that's gonna be C5 involved and extend is C7, both elbows and then wrists are C6. Ask the patient to add, abduct and adduct his or her fingers against resistance, and that's T1. Ask as an alternative to the patient to curl the fingers while applying resistance, that's C8. Ask the patient to bend and extend their knees, and the patient to, um, Ask the patient to plant or flex in the feet and ankles, that's S1 and S2, and dorsiflex the toes to gravity and resistance, that's L5. The major motor integrity in a unresponsive patient can be assessed via response to painful stimulus. So test on several locations uh, before assuming an absence of response. Okay, so these photos show the steps of a neurologic evaluation of the upper extremities. And then these show the evaluation of the lower extremities. Dermatomes are regions of the body where sensory components of spinal nerves supply specific areas of the body surface. So test general loss of sensations and ask about abnormal sensations. So pins and needles or uh, electric shock feeling um, assess sensory integrity bilaterally from the feet up. So identify the lowest level of normal sensation and assess the patient's perception of a light touch or temperature and position. Okay, reflexes can provide valuable information about the sensory input. Um, and so specific uh, reflexes are usually absent but return several hours or weeks later. Um, and um, if reflexes are intact, preservation of motor and sensory activities is likely. A positive Babinski reflex occurs if the toes move upward in response to the stimulation of the soles of the feet. And you want to reassess. It's necessary to determine whether the patient is stabilizing, improving, or deteriorating, and monitor vital signs every five for the unstable and 15 for the stable, and be alert for hypotension without other signs of shock. Okay, check your interventions and repeat the physical exam and reprioritize the patient and document suspected spinal cord injuries. Head trauma comprises both head injury and traumatic brain injury. Head injury is traumatic insult to the head with injury to the scalp or the skull, not including the face or brain. Traumatic brain injury is an impairment of the brain function brought about by external force such as a fall. So traumatic brain injury statistics, according to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, traumatic brain injury is responsible for 30% of trauma-related deaths each year, 2.8 million visits to emergency departments, 282,000 hospitalizations, and 50,000 deaths. 
from 2007 to 2013 traumatic brain injury related emergency department visits increased by 50%, but the number of deaths decreased by seven. So causes of traumatic brain injuries include 47% are falls, 15% uh, is unintentional, unintentional blood trauma, and then motor vehicle is 14 and unknown is 25% or 24%. Okay, so causes of traumatic brain injury by group, um, greater than 65 years or older are falls. Uh, 25 to 64 is intentional self-harm and motor vehicles accidents are five to 24 year olds. Below is uh, zero to four year olds, it's assault. So general types of head injuries, just like any other trauma, is uh, there's two categories, it's open or closed. Now closed are the most common. They're associated with blood trauma and dura matter undamaged and brain tissue is not exposed. It results in a skull fracture or traumatic brain injuries and it may be focal or diffuse. So focal is limited to the focused area and diffuse is diffuse spread out um, with increased intracranial pressure. An open uh, type of head injury is associated with a penetrating mechanism such as gunshot wounds, it's the most common, and the highest mortality rate. Penetration of the dura mater and cranial contents, uh, the brain tissue move to the environment. So let's talk about some pathophysiology of uh, head injuries. When you have scalp injuries, the scalp comprises of four, five layers, and the role of the scalp is the following. So it protects the head from the outside organisms, it provides thermal regulation and controls the loss of extracellular fluid through evaporation. Variations from minor to serious scalp lacerations occur. Even small lacerations, though, can lead to significant blood loss due to the scalp's rich blood supply. So do not be distracted, though, by the injury at risk of missing an underlying injury. And hypovolemic shock in adults is rare, uh, rarely caused by scalp lacerations alone, though. Scalp lacerations often indicate uh, a deeper, more serious injury. Consider the mechanism when it comes to the scalp injuries. You want to inspect for indications of missing tissue or impelled objects or some type of contaminant and evaluate for signs of continued bleeding and reevaluate often. In isolated lacerations, you want to stop the bleeding, apply direct pressure and pressure dressings, and if time and other injuries do not prevent it, a quick cleaning rinse can reduce the incidence of infection. But do not explore the injury. This may disrupt the clot formation and restart bleeding. When it comes to skull fracture, uh, they're significant related to the type of fracture, the amount of force, and the area of the head that sustained the blow. Potential complications include intracranial hemorrhaging, cerebral damage, and cranial nerve damage. We're going to talk about the four types of skull fractures. And the very first one we're going to talk about is the linear skull fracture. And this is a non-displaced fracture. And uh, think of the linear as the, a line, right? It accounts for the majority of all skull fractures. And it uh, most likely occurs in the temporal parental region of the skull. Radiographic uh, evaluation is needed for a diagnosis. So you need an x-ray because usually you won't be able to feel it, the lineal skull fracture. But when it comes to the depressed skull fractures, you're going to be able to feel it. Not that you want to um, press on it, but um, they result from high energy direct trauma to a small surface area of the head with a blunt object. The frontal and perennial regions are most susceptible because the bones are relatively thin. Patients often present with neurologic signs, so like a loss of consciousness, and these fractures have the greatest association with patient death. Basal or skull fractures, they're associated with high energy trauma, but usually occur following diffuse impact to the head. They can be difficult to diagnose without uh, um, an x-ray. And then you have the open skull fractures. They result, uh, they're a result of severe force being applied to the head, often associated with trauma to multiple body systems, exposure of brain tissue to the environment, and they have a high mortality rate. So the assessment and management of skull fractures is what we're gonna talk about next. 
and you want to use the pads of your fingers to apply pressure over the entire skull. The basilar skull fracture signs you're going to have the central nervous system or uh, CSF fluid draining from the ears or nose and a paraorbital ecchymosis that develops around the eye. So that's raccoon eyes and then ecchymosis behind the ears and that's the battle sign. But that ecchymosis behind the ear, the battle sign, it may not appear for up to 24 hours after the injury. All right, so identify and treat all life threats and provide manual inline stabilization of the cervical spine and then provide uh, supportive care for linear skull fractures. So traumatic brain injury is classified into primary brain injury or secondary brain injury. The primary injury to the brain um, when uh, that is the injury to the brain and its associated structures, and it results instantaneously from the impact to the head. When it comes to the secondary brain injury, it is the consequence of the primary. It includes abnormal processes such as cerebral edema or intracranial hemorrhaging, increased ICP or cerebral ischemia, hypoglycemia or hypotension, or infection. It can last anywhere from a few minutes to several days following the initial injury. So motor vehicle accidents, the most common cause of brain injuries are coup contra coup. So that's the front and rear type of injury. The passenger's head hits the windshield on impact and the brain continues to move forward until it strikes the inside of the skull. Then the head falls back against the headrest and the brain slams the rear of the skull. This type of injury may occur on opposite sides of the brain in a lateral crash. So the injured brain starts to swell because of the dilated cerebral vessels and an increase in cerebral fluid, so cerebral edema. Intracranial pressure. So to function properly, the brain needs a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients such as glucose. Blood flow through the brain, so that's the cerebral blood flow, flow must be maintained at a constant level. An increase in ICP can be caused by accumulation of blood within the skull or swelling in the brain. Increased ICP squeezes the brain against the bony promises within the cranium. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals the difference between the mean arterial pressure and ICP. The MAP is this diastolic blood pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. The normal ICP is 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury, and the normal MAP is 85 to 95 millimeters of mercury. Any increase in ICP above 20 millimeters of mercury decreases the CPP and cerebral blood flow. The body responds to a decrease in the CPP by increasing the MAP. This process is known as autoregulation. The brain can autoregulate and ensures adequate cerebral blood flow when the CPP is between 60 to 160 millimeters of mercury. The crucial minimal threshold is at 60 in an adult. If the CPP is less than 60, this leads to cerebral ischemia. And if the CPP is greater than 160, it produces hypertensive encephalopathy. In an effort to combat increasing intracranial pressure, the body uses um, this Monroe Kelly doctrine. So in response to an expanding intracranial mass, the body reduces intracranial pressure by expelling CSF and venous blood from the cranial vault. The mechanism keeps the ICP within normal limits in early stages. So when the ICP begins to rise and the CPP begins to drop, the body attempts to maintain the CPP and increasing the MAP. So it's to recognize this pattern, you must auscultate blood pressure, noting both the systolic blood pressure and diastolic. Other factors interfere with CPP, so excessive carbon dioxide in the blood, hypotension, swelling, and bleeding. So pre-hospital treatment should focus on maintaining the cerebral blood flow while mitigating increased intracranial pressure.
So with, when it comes to herniation, if increased intracranial pressure is not treated properly, the cerebral herniation may occur. So lateral herniation syndrome is the most common form of herniation. This is when a portion of the temporal lobe is displaced laterally. It, it then moves downward through the, um, basically the brainstem and it compresses the midbrain and posterior cerebral artery. Signs of herniation include pupil dilation, um, opposite side or motor dysfunction, and central herniation syndrome occurs when the brain tissue shifts downward, ultimately compressing the brainstem from above. Brainstem compression destroys the respiratory center, inducing apnea, decreasing perfusion to the rest of the brain, and ultimately causing death. These patients require immediate surgery to place a drain. Early signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure include vomiting or a headache, altered level of consciousness or seizures, and later signs of ICP include hypertension, widening pulse pressures, bradycardia, or changes in respirations. And uh, that's the Cushing's triad, so the Cheyenne Stakes Stokes respirations. Um, and basically, it's efforts to reduce the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, unequal pupils or non-reactive pupils, or uh, coma or posturing. Okay, so this figure shows posturing, and it indicates a significant intracranial pressure. The top one, you have decorticate, and that's a coring in, and the bottom one is decerebate, and that's a, um, a posturing out. When you talk about diffuse brain injuries, they affect the entire brain. It's also known as a cerebral concussion, and the brain is basically jarred around in the skull. It's caused by rapid acceleration or deceleration forces. And these forces damage the cell membranes of the neurons, which depresses neural activity. Uh, basically, you, the signs and symptoms are headache, confusion, disorientation, or loss of consciousness. You could have retrograde amnesia or anterior grade amnesia. Um, retrograde, of course, is before. Uh, anterior grade is, is after. The loss of the memory relating to the actual events that occurred. Okay, so as a paramedic, you probably will treat patients who have experienced a concussion. Concussions are cause more than 1 million emergency departments annually visits. And um, so it's estimated that there are about 1.6 to 3.8 million sports-related concussions annually. Uh, suspect a concussion even when the helmet is used. Athletes, athletic venues are a common site of concussions, and most youth coaches are required to take concussion training. Assessment and management include complete the primary survey and address any life threats. Secondary assessment is directed at evaluating for the presence of a concussion. So if you suspect a concussion, you must complete a thorough evaluation and you're gonna, um, assessment of, will focus on the prime, primarily on cognition. Patient history is a key component and ask your patient questions to assess his or her memory and awareness of person, place, time, and situation. Findings of a concussion include a headache, that's the most common finding, fatigue or fogginess, confusion or altered mental status, inability to recognize people or places, maybe disorientation or dizziness or difficulty concentrating or memory deficits, difficulty maintaining balance or visual disturbances or debilita uh, delayed responses to questions or irrita irritability, changes in behavior, sleep disturbances, so there's a lot of them. Several assessment tools and scales can help you identify a possible concussion. So there is an acute concussion evaluation tool from the CDC, and the emergency treatment of a patient with an isolated concussion is as follows. So primarily support and uh, manual physical, uh, physical and mental rest. So if the patient refuses transport, obtain a refusal, and your system may require you to contact medical control, so give the patient specific CDC information. A second impact syndrome. Ask the patient about recent concussions. Second impact syndrome is rare. It's often fatal result of receiving a second concussion while still recovering from an earlier one. The brain is still vulnerable and a minimal force can result in an increased cerebral blood flow, brain herniation, and death. So 
um, death can occur in two to five minutes after that injury. So signs and symptoms are a sudden loss of consciousness after that blow, a stunned appearance or dilated pupils, um, coma or respiratory failure. The emergency department of second impact syndrome is supported, uh, the treatment of it, and the second concussion that occurs within seven to 10 days of a previous concussion necessitates immediate transport to the closest facility with a neurosurgical capability. Post-concussion syndrome, so the patient may experience signs and symptoms for three to six months after the initial concussion. This differs from second impact in that it is a result of the original concussion, not a second one, and it requires the patient to be transported for evaluation by a physician. Post-concussion syndrome should be suspected when a patient has at least three of the following symptoms for at least three months after the concussion, so headache, dizziness, fatigue, irritability, insomnia, difficulty concentrating, memory difficulty, or intolerance of stress or emotion. Okay, so we're going to talk about diffuse axial injuries next. It's one of the most common diffuse brain injuries, has a high mortality rate, it's the most common cause of post-traumatic unconsciousness and the most common cause of persistent ve vegetated state after a traumatic brain injury. It involves stretching, shearing, tearing of nerve fibers, and axial damage. So it's caused by high speed or rapid acceleration or deceleration forces, and it's classified as mild, moderate, or severe. Okay, so assessment and management. The primary finding is unresponsiveness. It could last for more than six hours. Treatment is the primary supportive. And uh, be wary of airway compromise. Perform primary survey and address the life threats. Patients should be transported to the closest facility with in-house neurologists. So when you talk about specific grossly observable brain injuries, the first one we're going to talk about is a cerebral contusion, and that's when the brain tissue is bruised and damaged in a local area. There's greater neurologic deficits are observed with, with this than the concussion. And the frontal lobe is most commonly affected. Swelling of the brain leads to increased intracranial pressure intracranial hemorrhaging. So there's a couple of them that we're going to talk about. And the first one we're going to talk about is an epidural hematoma. And that's an accumulation of the blood between the skull and the dura mater. Happens in half a percent to one percent of all head injuries. There uh, always results from a blow to the head. Ordinarily, there's an immediate loss of consciousness and then a brief lucid level and then another loss of consciousness. All right, so there's a high survivability with early treatment, and uh, their signs and symptoms are limited to those of the associated concussion and any soft tissue damage or crepitus to the area of impact. So that's the epidural. And then the subdural hematoma is the accumulation of blood beneath the dura mater outside of the brain. This is the most common intracranial hemorrhage. It's associated with venous bleeding. ICP develops more gradually, so it's a slow venous uh, bleeding. Patients often experience a fluctuating level of consciousness and slurred speech. It is classified as acute, subacute, or chronic. Okay. And then there's intracerebral hematoma. So this is the third one. And this is uh, results from a penetrating trauma to the head or from rapid deceleration forces. Many are associated with other brain injuries, such as a diffuse axial injury. And the patient's condition deteriorates quickly, and there's a high mortality rate with this, even with surgery. And then there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So a subarachnoid hemorrhage is bleeding in the subarachnoid space. This results in bloody CSF and men meningeal irritation. So it causes include trauma or ruptured, uh, rupture of an aneurysm. The patient typically presents with sudden severe headache. As, de as bleeding increases, signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure develop. Okay, so the last two we're going to talk about is the subgaleal hemorrhage. This is the first one, and it can result in enough blood loss to precipitate hypovolemia in infants. And then you have the supragaleal hemorrhage, and that's a firm nodular mass. It's known as a goose egg, usually used to describe it. 
So when you talk about considerations and factors such as the severity of the injury and the patient's level of consciousness, treatment priorities must be based on the conditions that will kill the patient first. So always check for breathing pattern and rate and determine the, if the patient has abnormal bleeding pattern, breathing pattern. Watch closely for signs of increased intracranial pressure and ensure time on scene does not exceed 10 minutes. Maintain an open airway and ensure the patient's breathing is adequate. Thermal management is, is important for the assessment and management, so do not allow the patient to develop um, a high body temperature. So it can worsen the condition of the brain and do not cover the patient with blankets if the ambient temperature is 70 degrees or higher. So uh, pharmacological therapy, uh, is usually not indicated for brain injury patients. It may be ordered if transport will be prolonged though. Seizures must be terminated as soon as possible. Um, benzodiazepines should be used first and uh, no neuroprotective agents are currently administered in the pre-hospital setting. So when it talks about uh, the pathophysiology assessment and management of spinal injuries, limited treatment option and heavy reliance on rehab over the acute intervention. So reducing incidence is the best option for decreasing associated mortality and morbidity. In the United States, there's 17,000 new cases each year. High mortality rates are the highest in the first year after the injury. And the leading cause of death for the um, uh, SCI patients are after their discharge from the hospital is pneumonia or a pulmonary emboli or um, sepsis. Mechanism of spinal injury, so um, the force that causes the injury to the spinal cord. Anytime you suspect a spinal injury, you should assess whether the spinal injury is uh, or spinal immobilization is necessary. Also the medical history, so the patient's age, factors associating with decreased bone density such as alcohol abuse or cigarette smoking. Um, diabetes, and then also common locations. So most spinal cord injuries occur in the area of the cervical spine. And the most, the next most common is the lumbar region. There are flexation injuries. So flexation injuries uh, result from the forward movement of the head at C1 to C2 level. Farther down the spinal cord forces can result in an interior wedge fracture. Hyperflexion injuries are of greater force and can result in teardrop fractures. And then patients can experience lateral bending as well. Okay, the next is rotation with flexation. The area, only area of the spine that allows for this significant rotation is C1 to C2. And injuries are considered unstable due to the high cervical location um, and the lack of support. All right, so these injuries often result from high acceleration forces. Vertical compression, it's transmitted through the vertical bodies and it results from a direct blow to the crown or rapid deceleration from a fall through the feet, legs, and pelvis. And uh, primary uh, cervical spine injury is when the fragments of the bone become embedded in the cord. Then there's the distraction injury, so it's opposite of the compression. It results when parts of the body are pulled in opposite directions. Most classic distraction injury is a hangman's fracture. Uh, and uh, mixed mechanisms with some sort of rotational flex and extension forces usually occur together with these injuries. Hyperextension is when it results in fractures and ligaments, injuries of variable stability stable with the head and neck in flexion, and unstable in extension due to the non-structural support. All right, so categories of spinal cord injuries include the primary spinal cord injury that occurs at the moment of impact. It could be penetrating trauma, blunt trauma, or spinal cord concussion. Spinal cord concussions are caused by fracture, dislocations, or direct trauma. And then there's cord laceration. So this usually occurs when a projectile or bone enters the spinal canal. Then there's the secondary spinal cord injury. It occurs when multiple factors create a progression of the primary spinal cord injury, minimize further injury through stabilization, natural alignment, and spinal immobilization.
and then there's the effects of the spinal cord injury. So that spinal cord compression, it can it can result from an outside or internal forces on the spinal cord. And both cervical uh, spinal cord injuries either are complete or incomplete. And a complete spinal cord injury is a complete disruption of all the tracks of the spinal cord. It's a permanent loss of all cord-mediated functions. And then there's incomplete spinal cord injuries, and that's uh, some degree of the cord mediation function is retained. Anterior cord syndrome is a result of displacements of bony fragments into the anterior portion of the spinal cord. It's often due to flexation injuries or fractures. Then you have central cord syndrome. And this is hyperextension injuries to the cervical uh, area present with hemorrhage or edema. Central cord syndrome often occurs in conjunction with tears to the anterior longitudinal ligament. Posterior cord syndrome, and this is associated with extension injuries, relatively rare syndrome, and it produces dysfunction of the dorsal columns. Okay, so next we're going to talk about neurogenic shock. It results from the temporary loss of the autonomic function at the level of the injury. Hemodynamic and systemic effects include hypotension, hypovolemia and sensation to um, sudden position and changes, uh, and decreased stroke volume and cardiac output, bradycardia, and hypothermia and absence of swelling. Also, there could be loss of bladder control, priapism, or some type of um, hypoactive bowels. So the evolution of spinal care. First, you want to immobilize. This is one of the most common procedures used in emergency medical services. Preventative immobilization of all trauma patients became routine. In the 1989, paper uh, toted the benefits of immobilization. So evaluation for each patient, indications for immobilizations and benefits and risk of immobilization. So potential negative consequences of using cervical collars and backboards, uh, the debate continues. Uh, determine what tools are necessary for proper patient care per your protocol. There's studies and providers can use certain criteria to identify patients who do not need to be immobilized. Patients who may not need to be immobilized include ambulatory patients or patients with penetrating trauma, but no neurologic deficit. Also patients with um, a complete cord already damaged or spinal cord, they, they might need not need to be um, immobilized. So complications are associated with immobilizing patients with penetrating trauma, and they include it takes time, and there could be delays, and it takes multiple people, and also immobilization can complicate and thereby delay airway management and other procedures within the primary survey. So potential negatives of using a backboard, you could have hyperextension of the cervical spine, and it can result in a neurologic deficit. Patients immobilized for prolonged periods of time often develop pain in the occipit or sacral or lumbar, lumbar areas. There's uh, other complications are ulcers and pressure sores or increased risk of aspiration, respiratory compromise, and uh, raise in ICP due to improperly fitted cervical collars. So applications for current paramedic practice, views on spinal immobilization may be based on historical approaches to treatment, opinion, and interpretation of data. Always follow your local protocols when providing any treatment, and this also applies to immobilization. So there are three common approaches to immobilization. You could immobilize all trauma patients um, due to mechanism when patients with an identified mechanism are evaluated for the presence of a spinal cord injury and either fully mobilized or not, and patients with a mechanism are evaluated for the presence of a spinal cord injury based on selective criteria. So limiting the progression of secondary spinal cord injuries, a major goal of pre-hospital management, so treatment, perform the primary survey, including the ABCDE, form a treatment plan, and perform appropriate treatments as described earlier. During the disability phase, perform a neurologic exam and complete assessment of the spinal cord for deformity, crepitus, step-offs, and point tenderness. 
place a cervical collar on if indicated and immobilize the patient to the backboard, scoop stretcher, or air mattress. The goal should be to spend no more than 10 minutes on scene. Use a slower approach to treatment if spinal cord injury uh, for patients who have spinal cord injury with no life threats. And do not ignore life threats to the ABCs by focusing on immobilization and packaging, of course. Okay, so some best practices to spinal splinting is to remember that when splinting, the spine should be considered one long bone. There are a few caveats about traditional methods of spinal immobilization, so there is no optimal device for spinal immobilization. You could use a vacuum mattress or a pad behind the occiput. Adult patients require about half an inch to two inches of padding behind the occiput to maintain that neutral position. Because of the large occiput, when you have the pediatric patient, they require padding under the torso to maintain the normal position to avoid hyperflexation. Um, blanket rolls between the legs and along sides of the body fill voids. Uh, cloth tape is a ineffective at immobilizing the head and body. A rigid collar and a rigid cervical immobilization vice provide the best immobilization of the head. Head, shoulders, and pelvis should be immobilized because they are the weight centers of the body and are subject to the most movement. Axial movements provide better spinal alignment than do lateral movements. Manual stabilization, so apply during the primary assessment or primary survey. Grasp the head firmly between your hands. Maintain manual stabilization from the patient's front, rear, or side, and use neutral positioning to allow the most space for the cervical cord. Do not move the patient's head. If the patient has any muscle spasms in the neck or increased pain move with movement or numbness and tingling. And when you put on the collar, so a cervical collar is intended to eliminate the axle load of the head by reducing flexation and extension of the neck. It does not prevent the patient from turning his or her head. Okay, so maintain that stabilization even when you have uh, the collar in place until the patient is fully immobilized. So when they're supine, the patient can be immobilized by securing him or her to the long backboard, provide the greatest possible stabilization while immobilizing the patient, okay? And then uh, place a blanket rolls on the side of the patient between the legs. That could help uh, fill those voids. This applied. If you're using individual straps to secure the patient to the backboard, you must use at least five straps, okay? So one strap is gonna be over each shoulder, Cross them in the center of the sternum at the X, each strap to the side of the backboard, opposite of the shoulder, it crossed several inches below the iliac crest is the next, and then bring one strap over the top of the iliac crest, cross these two straps at the pelvis, and secure them near opposite sides of the hip, and then you could secure the legs with the straight straps over the thighs and lower legs. Ensure that the head and torso uh, torso and pelvis move as a unit with the teammates controlling the movement of the body. Patients found in the prone position or on their side should be log rolled into the uh, supine position to be immobilized. When it comes to seated patients, the indications of spinal injury with uh, the severity of associated injuries will dictate your approach to the seated patient. If any of the following criteria are met, lower the patient directly onto the backboard using a rapid extrication technique. So if your patient's in danger, or if you have to gain access to them um, immediately, or if the patient has life-threatening injuries. Place the cervical collar and manually stabilize the entire spine. Seated patients may have no indication for spinal injury, but if the patient is in cardiac arrest, chest compressions take priority, of course, and then you're gonna do that rapid extrication. All right, in the absence of a local protocol that directs you otherwise, refer to skill drill 34-3 to mobilize the seated patient. When it comes to rapid extrication, rapid extrication is a process of manually stabilizing and moving the patient from a sitting position into an immobilization device without the use of a vest type device. So use the rapid extrication when the vehicle is unsafe or the scene is unsafe or the patient cannot be properly assessed or the patient needs immediate intervention. 
or immediate transport, or the patient blocks your asset access to another serious injured patient. Do not use the rapid extrication technique if the injuries are not urgent. And follow the extrication requires, or rapid extrication requires a team of three experienced providers. Okay? And so these figures show the rapid extrication technique. Packaging and removing an injured patient from water. So when the patient has sustained a spine injury in a diving accident, and the spinal mobilization must be initiated before the patient is removed from the water. Assume all spinal injuries if there's a, it's a diving injury or boating injury or watercraft or a fall from height. If respiratory arrest is suspected, ventilation can be done while still in the water. Cardiac arrest, you need to quickly evaluate the mechanism. In case of cardiac arrest, when the spine injury is not obvious, immediately remove the patient from the water and begin CPR. If there is an indication of a spine injury, you want to place the patient prone, place your arms across the head and back, continue to support um, the head and neck, open the airway and begin ventilation, and secure the head and trunk to a backboard, remove the patient from the water on the backboard. Remove wet clothes and cover the patient with a blanket and consider using an advanced airway device if needed and place the patient on a cardiac monitor if they treat dysrhythmias. These figures show the process of stabilizing a spinal injury in the water. When a patient wears helmets, so helmets can um, inhibit full exposure of the patient, hindering efforts of the respiratory management and stabilization. The removal of helmet can result in spinal motion, so only providers who are familiar with the procedure should attempt to remove the helmet. All right, so stabilize the helmet by placing your hands on either side of it with your fingers on the patient's lower jaw. Your partner should open the face shield and assess the airway and breathing. Once the strap has been unfastened, your partner should place one hand on the patient's lower jaw and behind the head and gently slip the helmet partially off the patient's head, stopping halfway. Then your partner then slides his or her hand from the back of the helmet to the occiput, remove the helmet, and provide manual inline stabilization, and apply the rigid collar. And you may need to add padding under the shoulders to uh, or the head to prevent flexation of the neck. So this figure shows the steps we were just talking about to remove the helmet. Okay, so um, pharmacotherapy of the spinal cord injury. Short-acting reversible sedatives are commonly recommended for acute agitated patients. Pain management may be necessary, and corticosteroids were historically used in acute phase of a spinal cord injury, but many recent protocols avoid their use. So complications of a spinal cord injury are a cause of high mortality and morbidity. There are are the prevention for aspiration and respiratory arrest, especially with high cervical injuries. Loss of intercostal muscle impairs coughing and deep breathing, and deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emblem, emboli are late complications. Autonomic dysflexia, so it's also called autonomic hyperflexia, and is a late complication. It's potentially life-threatening, most commonly occurs with injuries above T4 to T6, results in parasympathetic stimulation. So a massive uninhibited um, cardiovascular response occurs. Systolic blood pressures of greater than 200 and diastolic of greater than 130. And then vagal uh, compensation. So it causes bradycardia and vasodilation of the peripheral and vascular vessels above the level of the lesion. So common causes are skin lesions or constrictive clothing or sharp, sharp objects compressing. So pre-hospital treatment, you want to focus on supporting the uh, vital systems, and it may cause a reduction in blood pressure with vasodilators. So then non-traumatic spinal conditions. So back pain is common presentation um, for patients who call EMS. Susceptibility to injury or degenerative disease may occur during uh, due to weight, an upright posture bears on the lumbar spine. So also spinal tumors 
can also cause pain. Your assessment should call, should include the ABCs and sample history evaluation of pain levels. A typical finding is that pain diminishes with decreased movement. So any patient with a suspected non-traumatic spinal disorder should undergo a neurologic and function examination before movement. Degenerative disc disease is common in patients older than 50. Over time, the disc will lose weight and some of the shock absorbing effect. So disc herniation may occur in patients with pre-existing disc degeneration. Definitive diagnosis may require multiple modalities of x-rays. And pre-hospital management is directed at decreasing pain or discomfort. And then there's spinal stenosis, and that's a narrowing of the spinal canal that can occur at single or multiple levels. This causes compression of exiting nerve roots. So pain radiates from the back to the legs and arms and uh, place the patient in a comfortable position if transport is required. And then you have uh, injury prevention, of course, prevention of the head and spine trauma includes safety measures that can decrease risk of injury, driving safety and always wearing seatbelts, and motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles should not be ridden by two persons on the same vehicle. So adhering to posted safety alerts, for example, those regarding safe diving at swimming pools. Okay, so that concludes uh, Chapter 34, Head and Spine Trauma Lecture. Thank you for joining us today.